it, like it just really bothered me like when I was listening to that podcast earlier today with with old Doc Bill there. It was just like, where is he getting half of this stuff? <laughs> For the listeners, I think it was like episode 84 or 85 with Dr. Bill Schnevelin. He claims to have been a Freemasonic vampire, wizard, warlock, oh, that, all sorts that, of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's what we're talking about when when, he, when we say Dr. Bill. So just so people know, if he's, you want to go check that out. He seemed, I don't know, he seemed a little deluded on a few things. Here comes the sun and I say and that this is going to be the final finale. Hello, my friends. Welcome back. David connects a transliteration in the Bible to a fictional female pope from the 9th century, then somehow claims that Luciferians believe this is a sign of the coming of the Antichrist. What evidence does he have, you may ask? Well, he has the planet Venus, a tarot card, a mythological Babylonian sea monster, and many snippets of text taken out of context from Albert Pike and Eliphas Levi. So clearly, this is a well-documented and well-researched pile of steaming bullshit. So hold on to your nose, because we are going in. This is the Raider, the Rider Weight Tarot card of the High Priestess. Now, I'm going to be reading from a book by Arthur Edward Wait. Actually, this book here is a book called The Mysteries of Magic by Lifus Levi, and it was translated from French to English by Arthur Edward Wait. He was in the Golden Dawn with Aleister Crowley. And along with Levi and Crowley, he was one of the real occult heavyweights of all time. And he designed a tarot card deck. He didn't design a tarot... <clears throat> He didn't design a tarot deck. In 1909, Arthur Waite commissioned an artist named Pamela Cole Smith to design the deck, which is known today as the Rider Waite or the Cole Smith Waiter Wright or Smith Rider Waite deck. Pamela herself was quite an adept occultist and a member of the Golden Dawn, drawing inspiration from her wealth of knowledge and understanding of occult symbolism. And here is his tarot card of the high priestess and you notice that there is the symbology of the sun on her head and there are the horns and in genesis chapter 14 it talks about the ashtoreth karnakim literally the ashtoreth of the two horns well that's all very interesting and whatever pamela coleman smith who designed the pictorial image of the high priestess as well as the other cards in the writer Wait, Smith deck drew inspiration from other areas. In the Rider Wait Tarot deck, upon which many modern decks are based, the High Priestess is identified with Shekema, the female indwelling presence of the divine. She wears plain blue robes and sits with her hands in her lap. She has a lunar crescent at her feet, a horned diadem on her head with a globe in middle place, similar to the crown of the ancient Egyptian goddess. Hathor, but with the horns having a shape more like half crescents and a large cross on her breast. The scroll in her hands, partly covered by her mantle, bears the letters T O R A, meaning divine law. She is seated between the white and the black pillars. J and B for Jachin and Boaz of the mystic temple of Solomon. The veil of the temple is behind her. 
It is embroidered with palm leaves and pomegranates. The motif that hangs behind the high priestess's throne, veiling whatever mystery she guards, is suggested in the pattern of the empress gown. The two are sisters, one bringing life into the world, the other inviting the living to the esoteric mysteries. Further, behind all of that is what seems to be a body of water, most probably the sea. The water flows through most of the cards of the Rider Waite Smith Tarot. And in Isaiah 14 and 12, Hallel ben Shahar, which is the literal Hebrew of Lucifer. No, it translated as Shining One, Son of the Morning. The title may refer to the planet Venus as the morning star, but the text in Isaiah 14 gives no indication that is the name of a star or planet. This was a designation of the planet Venus associated with the feminine. I'm not sure what the Hebrew name of the planet Venus was, but the Latin name for this planet is Venus. However, the title Halel ben Shakar may refer to the planet Venus. And we've talked a lot in spiritual warfare how that in the second heaven, that these luminaries were associated with the worship of entities. In your imagination, sure. We've talked about Orion, which was associated with Nimrod. Who is associating Orion, the Greek hero, with the biblical figure of Nimrod? What are you talking about, David? We've talked about the Pleiades, and they understood that when they worshiped the host of heaven, it's all over scripture, that they were worshiping this thing in second heaven that was manifesting itself as Lucifer. Weird. I didn't know that Homer was telling the tales of Lucifer in the Iliad. Many cultures see divinity or deities as heavenly, upward, and out of reach of mortal men. Even Christians claim that Jesus ascended to heaven, that God lives in a realm above humanity. So yeah, no shit, Sherlock. There was a connection between Lucifer and the planet Venus, and this is one of the many feminine aspects to Lucifer that there are. What? Have you checked your fucking diaper? Because this idiotic nonsense stinks. You are the one twisting the Bible and strawmanning supposed Luciferian ideology. And if you see the B and the J, oh this is the Jachin and the Boaz, and this is the twin pillars that we see in Freemasonry. That's correct. Hey, you're not a complete idiot. That is what the two pillars symbolize. Actually, they sell books on what the various tarot decks mean, but whatever. Often, decks come with a little booklet explaining all of the imagery. And if you notice on her lap, there is a book that's held upside down and she's holding it in her crotch to defile it. She's not holding it in her lap to defile it. It's resting on her lap. Where is she supposed to put the scroll, David? On her elbow? Maybe rolled out on the side where it can't be read? What the fuck? Seriously, how would such an innocent and obvious placement of a scroll to be read be construed as anything other than a convenient place to rest something? There is no table for her to place it on. If there was, it would interfere with the symbolism, David. And if you look real close, what's written on this is Torah. And this blasphemous Lucifer is defiling the Torah in between the twin pillars of Jachin and Boaz in the worship of the fallen angels. And this is just the epitome of blasphemy. Uh, slow down there, David of the Assumption. The symbolism created by Pamela Coleman Smith has running themes throughout the Smith weight rider deck. Water or blue is a common theme as well as the two pillars and the Kabbalah tree. The scroll reads T O R. A. This is repeated on the Wheel of Fortune as T-A-R-O. Scrolls often symbolize monumental declarations. The opening of Revelation scrolls, the New Testament, comes to mind, as do the Hear Ye, Hear Ye's found in film and literature. When a scroll is rolled up, it is unreadable and therefore contains secrets. The origins and meaning of 
Torah, and even Tarot itself, is hotly contested. Many take the easy route connecting Torah with the Hebrew Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament known as the Pentateuch, the cornerstone of Judaic law. In his 1988 book, The Tarot, Samuel L. Mathers recombined the letters T-A-R-O in several permutations, connecting them to the essences of the major arcana cards. T-O-R-A is not the Torah, but rather the letters of T-O-R-A. Again, a symbolic element that can be used by the interpreter for meaning. It is not a defilement to the first five books of the Old Testament, David. This is why there are RTR rituals being done by Satanists, the reversing Torah rituals that are done on every uh, weekly uh, study and on all of the holidays, these rituals are done because they know who the people are that have the power to cause them trouble. What RTR rituals are you talking about, David? What makes you think there is some grand conspiracy of Satanists or Luciferians doing rituals every week of reversing the Tarot? Which I don't even know how they would do that or even why they would do it. What would this accomplish? Any serious occultist spends their time pursuing their own personal work. They don't care about other people and what they do or who they worship or how they worship. As long as you leave Leave them alone and don't hurt anyone, they don't fucking care. I don't know what evidence you have to make this claim, but if there are Satanists doing rituals, so what? Isn't your God in control of everything? Aren't you covered in the blood of Christ? You are creating a threat where there is none, all for the purpose of furthering your own personal hateful agenda. Occultists have much more important things than work rituals on Christians who they've never met and have no reason to work anything against. There are literally a million other things on my mind to do besides waste my energy and time doing some stupid spell for some Christian in the middle of nowhere that I've never met and have no beef with. David, you are simply a transparent, hateful bigot. But, you know, it doesn't matter what little doodly do they do, uh, they're not going to win. You know, as the old saying goes, we've read the end of the book, and uh, these guys aren't going to get there. But this is about as disgusting and a blasphemous representation, and this is the representation of Pope Joan. One thing interesting on this picture that I see, I see the it looks like pomegranate, pomegranates in the background there. And I, I looked up the pomegranate symbol. It's pretty interesting if you look back at Zoroastrianism and, and stuff like that. And you also look back at the story of, uh, per, I guess it's Persephone, I believe is how you pronounce it. Persephone. I really shouldn't be saying anything. I mean, I always mispronounce things. But it is Persephone who was taken to the underworld by Hades. She ate three pomegranate seeds and had to stay in the underworld for three months. Her mother, Demeter, was so distraught that she neglected her duties and summer turned to fall and fall to winter during this time. When Persephone escaped the underworld, winter thawed to spring again. Uh, which is the god of the underworld. It's, it represents like a rebirth of this deity uh which is pretty pretty uh profound when you look at it like that as well when you see that stuff in the background pomegranates in phrygian myth castrated i'm not even going to try to say that name became the goddess Cybele, the blood forming the first pomegranate tree associated with persephone hades and the underworld death life and rebirth cycle central to the Eleusian mysteries honoring Demeter and Persephone as the feminine source and symbolic of the continuity of life. In 1 Kings 720 of the Old Testament, the pillars in the Temple of Solomon are said to have pomegranates above them, as well as 200 rows on each of the capitals all around. From 1 Kings 720 of the King James Version. 20. And the chapters upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above, over against the belly which was by the network, and the pomegranates were 200 in rows around about the other chapter. And there at her feet we have the horns of a bull. And what they call the planet Venus. What they call the planet Venus? Who is this elusive they? Are they the hardcore Satanists that are redefining the goddess Venus? A crescent moon can have many meanings. Here's one meaning from 
the website I just quoted earlier. The crescent moon looks like the horns of a cow, which connects this symbol to the cow goddess Hathor. It also signifies the maiden stage of the maiden mother crone triple goddess archetype, which also connects to the virginal Persephone, Artemis, and Mary. In Mesopotamia, the likeness to the horns of a bull connects with the masculine principle of insemination. Jung felt that the boat-like shape of the crescent connected to Ishtar's ship of life, a Babylonian symbol referring to a vehicle containing the seeds of all life. The Christian Madonna, Mother Mary, is often portrayed with her feet on a crescent moon, which would indicate the paradox of chaste virgin and vessel of divine birth. Now, the very name that she took, Johannes Angelicus. You mean the name people gave this alleged figure hundreds of years ago after this figure was supposed to have lived? Another problem, speaking on the validity of the Pope Joan claim, is the gap between the alleged events and the news of it. Not until the 13th century, which was 400 years after Joan. By the most accepted accounts ruled, does any mention of a female Pope appear in any documents? That's akin to word breaking out just now that England in 1600 had a queen named Elizabeth. And in Freemasonry, there are a lot of the rites of St. John. Well, they're not talking about John the Baptist or John the Apostle. No, they are talking about John, not Joan, John. In Freemasonry, and Albert Pike tells us this in Morals and Dogma, he talks about the Johannites and I'll just read a little bit of this for you on Morals and Dogmas on page 816. He said, There existed at that time in the East a sect of Johannite Christians who claimed to be the only true initiates into the real mysteries of the religion of the Savior. They pretended to know the real history of Jesus the Anointed and adopting in part the Jewish traditions and the tales of the Talmud, they held that the facts accounted in the evangels Alba are but allegories. The Jonanites are named after John the Baptist, not Joan. The mythical figure so named 400 years after she was alleged to have lived. What does Jonanites mean? The word comes from the name John or Johan in Hebrew. Jonanite refers to a spiritual tradition carried in part through the initiatory tradition of John the Baptist, exemplified in the relationship between Christ and the Apostle John, brought to fruition in the community addressed by the Gospel of John, the Gospel embraced by early Gnostics, and which produced the revelation to John the theologian. We strive to embody this tradition today. Albert Pike goes on to write, There existed at that period in the East a sect of Jonanite Christians who claim to be the only true initiates into the real mysteries of the religion of the Savior. They pretended to know the real history of Jesus, the anointed, and adopting in part of the Jewish traditions and the tales of the Talmud, they held that the facts recounted in the Evangels are but allegory. David ends the paragraph here, but Albert goes on. The key of which St. John gives in saying that the world might be filled with the books that could be written upon the words and deeds of Jesus Christ, words which they thought would be only only a ridiculous exaggeration. If he were not speaking of an allegory and a legend that might be varied and prolonged to infinity, the Jonanites ascribed to St. John the foundation of their secret church and the grand pontiffs of the sect assumed the title of Christos, anointed or consecrated, and claimed to have succeeded one another from St. John by an uninterrupted succession of pontifical powers. It is clear that Albert Pike is speaking of the Jonanites in relation to St. John and not a mythical female pope. And they went back and the Jonanites, they adopted the story in the Talmud that, of course, they say blasphemous things about Yeshua in the Talmud. I didn't find any blasphemous criticism of the Talmud in the Jonanite Church Frequently Asked Questions page. Individuals may hold opinions of the Hebrew Talmud. I assume that's the one you are referring to. But as a body, I cannot find any criticism. And in the mysteries, the oldest name that we know of a secret word in the mystery religions was Oanes. And Oanes was the fish god. And on the Pope's head, 
he's got his little fish hat. Just turn that thing sideways and look at it. It's a fish head. The oldest name in what mystery school? Do you mean the Eleusian Mysteries? That's the oldest mystery school that I know of. But then again, I'm not an expert in ancient history. I am, however, aware of Mesopotamian mythology, and I know the mistake you are making here. It is not the oldest known word or even oldest secret word. Oanes was a sea monster that was believed to have taught mankind wisdom and was described by a Babylonian priest named Berossus. Only fragments of his writing survived, so the tale of Oanes has been handed down mainly through the summaries of his writings by Greek historians. One fragment reads, At first they led a somewhat wretched existence and lived without rule after the manner of beasts. But in the first year after the flood appeared, an animal endowed with human reason named Oanes, who rose from out of the Rethian Sea at the point where it borders Babylonia. He had the whole body of a fish, but above his fish's head he had another head, which was that of a man. And human feet emerged from beneath his fish's tail. He had a human voice and an image of him is preserved unto this day. He passed the day in the midst of men without taking food. He taught them the use of letters, science, and arts of all kinds. He taught them to construct cities, to found temples, to compile laws, and explain to them the principles of geometrical knowledge. He made them distinguish the seeds of the earth and showed them how to collect the fruits. In short, he instructed them in everything which could tend to soften human human manners and humanize their laws. From that time, nothing material has been added by way of improvement to his instructions. And when the sun set, this being, Oanes, retired again into the sea, for he was amphibious. Oanes was also associated with Dagon, a long-standing association with a Canaanite word for fish, perhaps going back to the Iron Age, has led to an interpretation as a fish god, and the association of merman motifs in Assyrian art, such as the Dagon relief found by Austin Henry Layard in the 1840s. The god's name was, however, more likely derived from a word for grain, suggesting that he was in origin associated with fertility and agriculture. The fish etymology was accepted in 19th and early 20th century scholarship. This led to the association with the merman motif in Assyrian and Phoenician art and with the figure of the Babylonian Oanes mentioned by Barossus in the 3rd century BC. Sure, the head of Oanes or Dagon could be extended and the top more pronounced and made to look a little more like the Pope's conical hat. Is that the extent of your argument, that they sort of look similar? Okay. And the mitre of the Pope is the mitre of Oanes, which become Dagon. No, David, the mitre hat comes from Roman time. The pontifical mitre is of Roman origin. It is derived from a non-liturgical head covering distinctive of the Pope, the camelculum to which also the tiara is to be traced. The camel column was worn as early as the beginning of the 8th century. The mitre developed from the camel column in this way. In the course of the 10th century, the Pope began to wear this head covering, not merely during processions to the church, but also during subsequent church services. As regards shape, there is such difference between the mitre of the 11th century and that of the 20th century that is difficult to recognize the same ornamental head covering in the two. In its earliest form, the mitre was a simple cap of soft material, which ended above in a point, while around the lower edge there was generally, although not always, an ornamental band and a circulus. And this is, as they will tell you, they just flipped it from Oanes to Johannes. Are you fucking kidding me, David? Oanes or Dagon has roots in grain or fish, possibly a fertility or hunting or agricultural deity. Not the same as a Jonanite. Two completely different words that, yeah, okay, share the same end vowels, but David, two words coming from two different cultures and two different time periods can sound similar and still be completely unrelated. So this is the pure priesthood of the ancient fish god, and that's what these people do. And of course, the fish god... I don't know who you are talking about. Are you talking about they again? The imaginary form of Luciferians who use straw man? You are saying they worship fish? Are you saying the Pope worships fish? Albert Pike worships fish? Who? Who has a fish god? He was the beast that come out of the sea. In the ancient traditions, he would come up out of the sea. 
and he would come up and teach them great knowledge, and then at the end of the day, he'd slither back. Yes, David. About 4,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, there was a Babylonian myth of a sea monster. But on page 817, and here it gets even more profound. I very much doubt that. These Johannite Christians, and they were anything but Christians. Burn! Burn! They were the ones that anointed the Knights Templar into the, the mysteries. And in the story of the Priory of Sion, the Priory of Sion, they claim to be the group that initiated the Templars into the mysteries. And everybody says, well, there's no mention of the Priory of Sion. Well, there is. It's right here. But they were called the Johannites. And the story's right here. Albert Pike doesn't mention the Jonanites with the Priory of Sion. Matter of fact, the words Priory of Sion isn't even written in Morals and Dogma. The Priory of Sion is another conspiracy that has been debunked many times over. I will leave a link to a well-documented and lengthy article from CBS News about this fictitious organization that was popularized by Dan Brown's <coughs> books. No historian has found any evidence that the Priory of Sion existed before Plantard set up his version in 1956. In other words, all that Plantard tells us, or what other people tell us about the Priory of Sion, that the Grand Master was Victor Hugo or Leonardo da Vinci is sheer invention. The Priory of Sion was just another figment of Plantard's imagination. David, you keep introducing concepts assuming that each one of these is somehow connected, but they aren't, and you haven't demonstrated a convincing argument that they are even related, and so far none of them are even true.